All right, we are skating through the uh, book of Mark here. Uh, now we're going to start really picking up. Um, we've kind of laid the groundwork already on um, who Christ is, uh, some of the characters. We looked at Mark, we looked at John the Baptist. Um, last Sunday, we talked about discipleship. We introduced four more people. That was uh, Peter, uh, his brother Andrew, James, and John. Um, one thing that I, I did want to mention that we talked about last Sunday was um, we talked about us doing the will of God and bringing those to Christ, just as Andrew brought uh, Peter or, or uh, Simon to Christ. We didn't know how he was going to use uh, Peter. And I had mentioned that it was Peter who Christ was going to build his church upon. And it wasn't he was going to build his church upon Peter, the man himself, but the confession that Peter had of who Christ was. That's where the, um, the, the foundation began to lay down and how Christ began to build up his church on the faith and confession of Peter. Uh, now, today, we've looked at healing. Or, I'm sorry, we looked at teaching and preaching. Uh, today, we're going to look at healing. So real quick, I'm just going to give you a couple more definitions. We said this last Sunday, but teaching involves clearly articulating the content of the message and preaching includes calling for a response to what is taught. Uh, this is what Jesus has been doing so far, preaching and teaching. Um, as I was getting into it and looking at it, I was like, what's the real difference between teaching and preaching? And I was like, well, I guess preaching is just a little bit more louder um, Teaching is just, you know, just talking, saying it through. Preaching is really putting that message out there and calling for that response. But again, we're going to look at healing today. And healing consists of visible demonstration of the power of the message. And so now Christ is on the scene. He's, he's gathering up his disciples. He has his four disciples with him. And now he's going to carry on and uh, begin to do amazing things. And this is where we're at today. We're going to look at a little bit of demonology. Um, the healings and what that looks like and what it consists of. So, again, we're here, the work of the servant. We're going to look at chapter uh, 1, finish that up today. So if you want to follow along, we're going to be in chapter 1, verse 21, all the way through chapter 2, verse 12, is what we're going to try to get through today. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to read through all this because it's a lot of reading. I will uh, dip down and, and get the uh, verses that we need. And so we'll go ahead with that and uh, break into it. The topics we're going to be looking at is um, demons, uh, uh, demons are cast out, healing manifest, uh, manifested, uh, a leper is cleansed, and the paralytic healed. Uh, so the mission here, the kingdom mission is to manifest the kingdom of God. And this is what uh, Christ has set out to do. He's already been doing some of this. And so now he's going to go uh, from town to town and begin his his healing. So when we last left off, uh, we looked at Christ in, Caper in Capernaum. He was here in the south side of Galilee, and now he's made his way up to the upper side of Galilee. Um, houses were a little better. He wasn't, you know, in, in Nazareth no more. He was actually on some lakefront property. He was hanging out with uh, uh, the fishermen, uh, very wealthy. We talked about how last time they weren't fishing just to, to feed themselves that day. They were, this was their business. They had uh, servants that worked for them. Uh, we talked about uh, Zebedee and Son Fishing Company, how they had all the, the things that they had, boats, nets, men, uh, so these weren't poor people. These weren't just, you know, I, I'm hungry, I need to go fish. This is what they did for a living. They fed not only their families, but other surrounding towns and villages, uh, international. Uh, so this is what they were doing. And so we move now. We want to get a, a, a better picture of where we're going to be at. So kind of zoomed in a little bit. So here he is in Capernaum. And he's already been kind of working the, uh, the sea a little bit. And so... He's, we're finally going to um, drop in, and we're going to end up in Capernaum, still on the upper side of Galilee. Um, so we'll go ahead and start right there. Verse 21. Then they went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Real quick, a uh, quick fact about synagogues. Um, because Jesus is often teaching in synagogues a lot as he travels. So uh, synagogue is where the Jewish people gathered for worship. 
Uh, the Greek word it literally means to gather together. Uh, synagogues actually originated in Babylonian captivity after 586 BC, the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar, and they served as places for worship and instruction. So on the Sabbath, they would all gather to just pretty much like church. They would gather to, uh, it started off in people's homes, and then they built up uh, little institutions. And so on the Sabbath, they would go and they would worship and hear the Word of God. Throughout the week, it would act as a, a school or a court. Uh, people would go and bring their, their issues, and the rabbi there or whoever was there, a scribe, would, would hear their, uh, their situation and, and uh, place a judgment on it. And so these were actually, um, again, scattered throughout Israel. Uh, and it could be for that very reason. Maybe, you know, God seen ahead, hey, I need my son to go in and, and be able to teach. Because uh, one of the traditions in synagogues is if you were a, a rabbi, a visiting rabbi, you were given the opportunity to go up and speak. And so Jesus would go to these synagogues as a rabbi, and he's a visitor, and they would let him go up and speak, and he would begin to teach and preach. And that's what we're going to get into right now. So he goes into Capernaum, and he's teaching. And here um, it says Jesus' authority over the spiritual realm. This is what we're about to get into. Uh, Jesus displays his authority and power in the invisible, invisible realm. And um, we talked a little bit about the Matrix last Sunday. And this is where we're going to kind of squeeze that in and what that looks like. The Matrix is uh, that movie where Neo, um, Mr. Anderson, is living in the real world. And um, he finds out there's another dimension. There's another realm. And so if you follow the movie all the way through, he's, he's taken out of the Matrix, the world that's been pulled over his eyes. And he's, he's seeing for the world for what it really is. And then he gets placed back into the system. And towards the very end, um, this is likened to us. This isn't, this isn't Christ yet. But um, towards the very end, he's able to see that other realm. He's, he's, uh, he's, he gets shot. He comes back and he sees things differently. He sees things for what they really are. So he sees the agent Smith and, and he sees uh, uh, that he's able to manipulate certain things. And that, that's the Christ-like. The, the, what I really want us to get into is that the demon part is um, the agents in the movie. Now, the agents were able to go in and out of people and manipulate the people, use the people for their own uh, uses, and then quickly get out. See, Jesus was able to see these things. So when Jesus enters this synagogue and he begins to teach, he's teaching with authority. So it says, teaches with authority. Unlike other scribes who would reference other rabbis, Jesus spoke with all full authority. The living word speaking the written word uh, is the powerful. It is powerful and can bring conviction. Um, and so when Jesus would get up and speak, he was speaking with full authority. He knew what he was talking about. He's the author of this word. Unlike the other rabbis who would, they would literally argue or they would reference, well, Rabbi Hillel would, uh, he would say this and, and or, uh, Gamaliel would, would taught this way or they would even argue, is it a sin to carry sticks on the Sabbath? I mean, they, they would get into, well, well, Rabbi Hillel says, if you know, if you're picking something up, that's actually work. Well, Gilmel says it's not a work. And so they would argue back and forth, not being really certain on what they were teaching, just what they've been told uh, traditions. Jesus comes in and shakes that whole thing up. He comes in and he begins speaking the word of God with authority like they've never seen before. It says that they were astonished. They were shocked. They were they were almost like their, their jaws were on the ground. They were like, what, how is this happening? What's going on? They'd never heard it spoke this way before. And then he, he, as he's speaking, the unclean, the unclean spirit recognizes Jesus and was among, and that's, that's another thing we've got to look at, that the uh, unclean uh, spirit was among believers carrying out Satan's agenda. The presence and power of the truth being taught disturbed the unclean spirit and astonished those who heard and saw. So Jesus is up there. He's preaching the word of God. He's, he's showing how these prophecies are being fulfilled. And, and while he's speaking, there's an unclean spirit there and it begins to be agitated. One thing, the demon automatically knew who Jesus was. He, he, he didn't have to question. As soon as Jesus started teaching and speaking with that authority, this demon begins to scream and says, I know who you are, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy us? And Jesus, with one word, tells him to get out, and he silences that, that demon. So we talked about Satan last time and his background, how he used to be an angel, and then there was followers. 
These are those followers. This unclean spirit, um, the word we're going to look at is, is uh, you can actually change out the, un the word unclean spirit for demon. So this demon is, is in the synagogue or in the church uh, doing Satan's will, which is to destroy and break up the fellowship, break up the church. So he's in there chilling. Satan or, or the demons in there just listening, waiting for his opportune time, kind of hiding out. And then Jesus walks in and he shrieks and he knows who Jesus is because Jesus created him. Jesus was there outside of time in eternity when he created these beings. And so the demon sees him and he's like, well, it must be time. I already, they know about the lake of fire. Before Revelations 20 was written, they knew about the lake of fire. So when Jesus comes, he's thinking it's time. It's judgment time. And I'm, I'm about to be cooked. I'm done. And so there's an interaction there. People see this man and they, he's screaming and he, uh, he, he casts that demon out. And it says that the man screams and convulses and, and shakes to the uh, and, and falls to the ground. Luke says he's unhurt. So the word for convulsion, I didn't put it up there, but it's sporoso. And that means to rip or tear apart. So when I'm thinking about this and Jesus is, is, is telling him, quiet, get out of him. That demon is being ripped from that man and it's convulsing that man so much that he falls to the ground and the demon is gone. But the man, he comes up, he's unhurt, he's clean in his right mind. And now people are, are, are seeing this and like, oh my gosh, man, what just happened? Who is this guy? And now the, the, the fame is starting to spread who Jesus is and the stories are starting to, to, to go around. And so now church is ending and just like everybody else, when we're done with church, we usually go to the house and we grub, we eat, we fellowship and hang out. So this is what's going on. They're, they're done. And uh, Simon and Andrew and James and John, they're talking. Luke gives witness to this, that they're telling Jesus about his mother-in-law. So Jesus goes to Simon's house. And here we're going to see that Jesus heals many. Not only It starts with uh, Simon's mom, but it's going to, uh, to lead into other things. So uh, Jesus heals many. The manifestation of the kingdom causes many to seek after Jesus because now there's an uproar. Now there, there's the, the buzz going around that, hey, someone's here. We think it's the Messiah. We've seen this happen and, and we've seen him cast out a demon. And so now Peter, James and John and Andrew, all of them, they're going to the house. They already told uh, Jesus what's going on with the mother-in-law. She's laying in bed. Says that, Luke says that she had a high fever. So anytime you have a fever, um, that means you have a, an infection in your body and your body's trying to fight it off. Well, this thing is so bad that she's laying down. She has a high fever. She's, she's weak. She can't move. She can't get up. So Jesus is lay, uh, uh, standing over and he rebukes that sickness and it leaves. And so after this, verse 29, no, we'll, we'll, yeah, verse 29. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew, James and John. But Simon's wife, mother, lay sick. Uh, Simon's wife's mother lay sick with the fever and they told him about her once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up immediately. The fever left her and she served them. And we're going to we're going to touch on this, but that that's that should be your response. When Jesus, you meet Jesus is gratitude. And what can I do to serve you? It, it's not that, oh, she's a woman. She should have been up and cooking and doing this. Nothing like that. When Jesus does something for you, your, your response should be to serve with gratitude. And that's exactly what she did. She got up and she began to serve and listen to his teachings. And now I'm, I'm sure that, that after that happened, one of the brothers or, or whoever was there in the house was like, hey, I just seen this man heal somebody. So now that's getting, getting around. And so as, as the, the evening goes a, a little more on, it says that verse 32, at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. So why did they wait to the evening? Because it was a Sabbath. You can't do things on the Sabbath. You couldn't walk. You couldn't. I mean, if they had to argue, can you carry sticks on the Sabbath? So they were there was like Black Friday. They were counting down when the sun gets. OK, everybody, let's bring all our sick, all our disease. We know where this man is. Let's go check him out. So there's a crowd. I'm sure Simon opens the door to his home. And you can imagine if you open up your door and the whole neighborhood is at your door. That's what he's dealing with right now. And so Jesus, again, um, begins to heal all these people. Jesus' uh, Jesus kingdom manifestation confirms the gospel truth. Uh, he is the Messiah. He is the, the one that was uh, prophesied. And so as he's teaching and preaching and manifest the gospel, it, it's showing that this is legit. He's able to heal. He's able to cast out these demons. Um, Jesus' no, 
kingdom manifestation gives a preview of the future eternal kingdom. We see that because it's a, it's a small preview that when you get to the kingdom of heaven, there's going to be no diseases. There's going to be no tears, no more pain. So when Jesus is there and present, those sicknesses, those diseases flee. So we get a small glimpse of, of what that, that future kingdom is going to look like. Jesus' kingdom manifestation demonstrates his authority over demons. Now we're seeing that he has the authority over the spiritual realm uh, and, and the physical, visible realm. And Jesus' kingdom manifestation demonstrates his authority over the physical and spiritual effects of the curse. Because remember, when Adam had sinned, the curse set in, death and decay became. And so now Jesus is, is, is taking that authority and he's showing the effects uh, uh, the, the effects that he has on that curse, which is healing and, and manifesting the kingdom and making people whole. Jesus makes, it, makes time to pray and stayed in perfect fellowship with the Father. Jesus preaches the gospel uh, to other towns and villages. And so we're going to read through that. Just We're not going to read all of it, but we're going to read a little bit of it. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about demons, um, the unclean spirit. We can, to get a better understanding of what this is, um, I, I, when I was younger, um, in my teens, um, and even younger than that, we used to live in apartments and, and man, we'd have vermin. I mean, there was rats and, and roaches. I mean, that's just something that, that happened. And, and what attracted those vermin was, uh, and it wasn't necessarily our, our place, but it could have been the people living around you that weren't clean. And so that uncleanness brings those vermin in. It's going to be the same way with us. When we're leaving, living unclean, immoral lives, we're attracting those vermin, those, those, those spiritual unclean spirits. Uh, um, those demons are coming because they're like roaches. They're like rats. They're, they're vermin. They're attracted to the unclean thing. And so when we live unclean, guess what's going to happen? We're attracting that stuff. And so the people who didn't know Christ, and, and again, he hasn't died yet, so the covenant has been made. The Spirit hasn't been uh, um, imputed to anybody yet. Jesus is the only one walking around full of the Holy Spirit. And so that's also another important thing that as a believer, if you are a believer and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you cannot be demon-possessed. You can be um, influenced and um, to do certain things uh, or, or think certain ways, and you can be oppressed. That demon or that unclean spirit can again influence you and oppress you with uh, addictions or, or anxiety or, or low self-esteem and it keeps you that way. It's not that you're possessed, it's just that influence of that demon and maybe the way you're living or maybe uh, the things that you're into that you've fallen into that's attracting these unclean spirits. Now the unbeliever on the other hand, they can be demon possessed. They can be uh, taken control of by a demon. And, and just a couple of things uh, about the un unclean spirit or demon. Uh, the unclean spirit has a personality because it expresses itself. It shrieks and it screams whenever it sees Jesus. It has intelligence because it knows about Jesus. It has power because it possesses a man. It has will because it wanted something. It, want, it didn't want to be destroyed. Um, so Jesus rejects the testimony of the demon, although once a messenger, now in a fallen sinful state, it's an illegitimate messenger now. Now he's a messenger of Satan. He was once a messenger of God, but now he's not going to let that demon speak and say, oh, well, this is the son of God. Why do you, why'd you shut him up? He's telling the truth. Well, because he doesn't want to cause confusion. And not only that, but... And we're all unworthy, but this demon is very unworthy to say these things. Uh, even though he's confessing something, uh, it's going to cause confusion amongst other people if they're like, well, this demon's saying that this is the Son of God. Do we believe the demon? Or do we, is he a lie? You know, so, so Jesus silences that really quick. And he doesn't want any confusion, so he, he, he casts that demon out and he keeps him quiet. And after that, he's, he's healing all these people. And he's making his round, or he's, he's, he's in, the, in the crowd, and he's, he's casting out demons, he's healing people. And I'm going to look at just a couple of brief words before we move any further. Uh, the word for authority is exousia. Uh, the power of authority, uh, influence, and of right of privilege. This is what Christ has, and this is what he's uh, displaying at the moment. And then, uh, this is going to be a tough one. A catharsis. In a, in a moral sense, means unclean in thought and life. So that's what that, that unclean spirit was. 
Uh, and then kakos, uh, badly, physically, or morally, a missed, diseased, evil. It means sick is what it is. Diseased and sick. Evil, previous, previously, miserably sick, sore. And then that one I know I'm going to mess up. Uh, Diamonosomai, Diamonosomai, uh, to be under the power of a demon, possessed with devils. That means just being possessed with demons. He's going and he's facing all these things. Again, kind of picture uh, Neo when in part two of the Matrix, where he's, his, he has no eyes and he has a blindfold on. And Agent Smith is in his realm now. And they begin to fight and he has this blindfold and he says, I see you. That's exactly what Jesus does. He, he's, he can go and enter a room and I see you, I see you, I see you. And the demons are freaking out like, oh man, he sees me, he knows who I am. And they begin to shout back at him. You know, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. They're trying to kind of cut him low, calling him Jesus of Nazareth, because remember that wasn't a, a very popular term. Um, Nazareth was a dejected place. It was, it was to me, it's, it's like, it just, kind of in the hood. It was the south side of Galilee. Nobody wanted to go to Nazareth and what good could come out of Nazareth? So when these demons seen him, like, man, I know who you are, Jesus from Nazareth. I mean, you could, you might as well be calling someone a grove rat. Oh, come on, Jesus. You, I know who you are, you grove rat. I, you ain't nobody. So he's trying to kind of undercut who he is. Um, but Jesus stands firm and he begins to cast out these demons. The next scene we're going to look into um, is the leopard cleansed. Uh, Jesus displays his authority and power over disease. Now, leprosy, uh, there was actually like 72 diseases under leprosy uh, that I was looking at. And it could be eczema. It could be a lot of things that whenever you would have a red, sore looking patch of skin, dry, flaky, even if you had fallen, let's say you had fallen, you got up and you're like, oh man, if someone sees this, they're going to think I have leprosy. Well, the, the whole thing was you have to go to a priest. They have to check you out. You have to uh, be cleansed. You have to offer up a sacrifice. I mean, it was a whole process. And then after all that's done, you wait seven days, you go examine again, and they'd be like, oh, man, that's just a scab. I mean, it was a long process they had to go through. This man actually had a full-blown leprosy. He said he was, he, and Luke, and I know I keep going to Luke. Luke was a physician, so he has a little bit more, better explanation, but he was full of leprosy. Leprosy not only messes up your skin, but it can actually get into the bones, make you kind of uh, brittle, your teeth even, uh, eyes. I mean, you, you're, you're beginning to deteriorate. And so when you had leprosy, you would have to be outside of the camp, away from people in, in deserted places. And you would have to wear tattered clothes just to signify, hey, I'm a leper. And then when you were coming within 50 uh, paces of someone, you, if you had a mustache, you had to cover your mustache and, and, and announce unclean, unclean. I mean, how, how bad is that? I mean, you, you can't even have a social life, you know, and, and we, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, so it's, 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 it's a bad scene, you know, because now you're, you're, you're kind of marking someone like, well, you know, that dude has leprosy, stay away from him. And, and, and Jesus kind of trades spots with this guy. And again, the news is spreading. We're going to find out very soon that there's Pharisees and scribes that are already hearing this stuff. Everybody is, is, is being astonished. No, no, uh, no opposition yet. And it's funny because in the synagogue, they're reading about the coming Messiah and, and, and waiting. And Jesus is there teaching and they still don't know who the Messiah is, but the demons do. They have no question about it. I mean, everybody else is like, oh, he's a good teacher. He's teaching with authority. They don't know he's the Messiah, but the demons knew automatically, hey, that's, that's him. He, he's, he's the Savior. He's the one that's going to uh, uh, place judgment upon us. Because after healing all those people, it was now nighttime, and Jesus kind of leaves off, and he begins to pray. Early in the morning, he gets up and pray, and Peter and the disciples go after him like, hey, everybody's looking for you, man, you know. We, we, we still got some work to do. There's a crowd, you know, the, the popularity is growing. Let's, let's take advantage of this. And Jesus is like, hold up. Let's go to the other towns. For this reason, that's, that's why I came. So he doesn't even go back and he goes to other towns and he begins this circuit of, of just teaching. And it's new to everybody. So he's doing the same thing over and over, going to a synagogue, teaching, casting out demons, preaching, healing people. And he, he eventually, as he's going, that's when he runs into this leper. 
Um, so the leper goes, he sees him from afar off. I'm sure he was already, you know, letting people know, unclean, unclean, unclean. He gets to Jesus and he falls on his knees and he implores him. And in, in, in that scene, the leper submits to Jesus' will in faith. Because he says, Lord, if you're willing, you know, will you do this? And he's like, yes, I'm willing. So he, he submits to his will. He's on his knees. He's submitting to the will. Jesus' healing is immediate. It's not like when you go to the doctor and they give you medicine. They're like, hey, here's some of this. Take some of these and call me in a couple days if you feel, you know, no, no. Jesus, when he speaks, when he, when he heals, it's immediate. It's immediately cleansed. You're, you're, you're done. You're healed. Uh, and Jesus tells the ex-leper to testify to the priest. So what Jesus wants this ex-leper to do is go to Jerusalem to show the priest, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm cleansed. And I'm sure when they go and they see this man, they're like, man, you don't even have leprosy. You're smooth as, as, as can be. You look, you look like baby skin. And so they have to go through the test. They have to kill the two, uh, two birds and, and make sure they examine him, wait seven days and, and get blood and oil, put it on his right earlobe, his thumb, his big toe, and do a whole cleansing ritual, shave his head and kill two lambs. I mean, that's a big process. And so he doesn't even do that. Uh, Mark is the only one that, that kind of tells on this leper because the leper... Uh, acts in disobedience and begin to tell everybody. He doesn't go straight to the priest. And you can imagine if the priest seen it and they're like, man, this dude's whole. He's clean. Jesus did this. And they couldn't deny that, but, but that didn't happen because the leper didn't go to uh, Jerusalem. Instead, the ex-leper proclaims his testimony freely uh, and the act of disobedience hindered Jesus' ministry so he could not enter the town openly. Now, this is the swap. This is where Jesus kind of changes, in my mind, changes places with the leper. Because when you have leprosy, remember, you have to be outside of the camp in deserted places. But now that he's cleansed, he's going into the town and he's able to have social life and, and his, he has his self-esteem is up now. And so he's in Galilee and in all these little villages. Meanwhile, Jesus now is going into the desert places because now he can no longer go into these, these cities. And so they swap places like that. Um, and it's almost kind of reminiscent of, of us and Jesus. You know, he, he's on the cross and he's taking our punishment, but then we swap places. We get his righteousness and he gets our sin. You know, um, good deal for us, not, not, not so much for Christ. Um, but that's what just happened there. Jesus heals this, this man, leprosy. Uh, again, the, the skin is really scaly. Bones are brittle. And he touches this man and instantaneously he's better. Um, and that's how, how Jesus begins to uh, confront these demons and heal people um, through his ministry. <clears throat> and then in chapter 2, the paralytic made whole. Uh, Jesus prioritizes spiritual. Uh, yeah, Jesus prior prioritizes spiritual condition over physical condition, because although this man had a, a very bad physical condition and he could have been paraplegic. I mean, even if you ever go to these, uh, if you go to Mexico or other little countries, you know, <clears throat> as soon as you cross over the border, there's people with, you know, they can't use their legs, but they're still scooting around and they're asking for money and grabbing on your legs. You know, hey, you want to buy some gum? You want to buy some candy and, you know, for some change. But this man, he had to be carried around on the bed. So it kind of makes me believe that he was full blown paraplegic. He could not move arms, legs, anything. And so he had to be lifted, carried all the way through to meet Jesus. So here... Jesus responds to faith and collective faith um, because Jesus, uh, the, the man couldn't take himself there, but his, his buddies, maybe their brothers, maybe their friends, they knew about Jesus. They knew if they could just get him to Jesus, he would be made whole. So their faith, coupled with the, the, pair, uh, the, the guy who couldn't walk faith, is what Jesus saw. And he's seen that. And, and he begins to heal. He responds to their faith and their uh, collective faiths because sometimes we need to piggyback off of each other's faith. Sometimes, you know, it may be where I may have to call Didi and be like, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing well. And uh, I don't even know if, if I want to pray about this or whatever, you know. And I have to piggyback off of his faith because he's like, I, I got you, bro. Let's, let's pray about this. So that's where, where fellowship comes in, too. Um, Jesus sees their collective faith. He heals the, the, the man. Um, 
And then Jesus confirms his authority to forgive sins through visible manifestation. Because again, the fame is spreading. The, the, the scribes are there. The Pharisees are there. And this is another time when we first started this series, we, we talked about how <clears throat> we're going to see Jesus' uh, humanness. And it says that he was moved with compassion when he seen this man and he, he healed him uh, because of their faith. And not only that, but he was able to discern what the Pharisees, the scribes, the, the people were saying. Because he's like, well, who can forgive sins except for God? Who, who does this guy think he is? He's like, and they were right. Only God can forgive sins. But they didn't know that that was God in the flesh. And so he, he's doing his thing. He, he's, he's manifesting the kingdom um, because that's what he's here to do, to let people know, to herald that the kingdom of God is here. He's casting out demons. He's healing. He's manifesting this visibly um, so that people can recognize and confirm that he is the Messiah. Jesus' healings, casting out demons and authority to forgive sins, establishes his identity. Uh, Jesus begins to face opposition because now the Pharisees and scribes, they see him and they're like, no, we don't like this. We don't like this. Now that they're starting to murmur. Before, there was no opposition. Chapter one, all that stuff, no opposition. They welcomed him, uh, loved him. Um, now we get to the Pharisees and Sadducees. And now we're starting to see that opposition a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and then not only that, Jesus says something. He says, you know, because he hears the murmuring, he, he's discerning their thoughts. And he says, which is easier to say, son, your sins are forgiven you or take up your bed and walk. But that you know that I'm the son of man, I have the power to forgive sins. Go, get up and walk. And so he's manifesting what he can do in the spiritual realm right there by his word. You're forgiven. And because you're forgiven, look at this. Now he's up and he's walking. So Jesus, even though the man was a paralytic, Jesus is more concerned with his soul, not his, his physical circumstances, but his spiritual uh, uh, soul, his spiritual circumstance. So Jesus goes straight to the matter. He forgives this man's sins. And with that, again, um, other things happen. I mean, I, I can imagine if you're, you're bedridden for, doesn't say how long, but I'm sure depression could sit in. I'm sure uh, anxiety can sit in because you don't want to be out with people and they're looking at you like, man, what's wrong with this guy? You know, I don't know, you know. And, and so now healing is taking place not only um, outwardly, he could walk now, but inwardly. He's forgiven. Now his, his self-esteem also is probably built up. And so Jesus is going, he's doing a work that no one's ever, ever seen before. He's on the scene. He's just like Neo. He's able to... Uh, discern certain things, see certain things, and, 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 and manipulate the world that he lives in because he created it. It's like this. If you, have a if you had built a computer and you ran the programs through and your script and all these things, the script is you know telling this thing what to do, that thing what to do, and there's a virus in your computer and you're trying everything you can do to get it out, but now we with this technology we have, we have those those VR, you know, you can look and it looks like you're there. Think about it like that. You're, you built this computer and now there's a virus in there. You can't get out. It's manipulating everything, messing everything up. And you're like, you know what? I'm going in there. I'm going to go in this thing I created and I'm going to take care of. It. That's exactly what Jesus did. He's sitting outside of time and space and he sees what he created. The viruses are running through, just tearing everything up. And he says, I got this. I'm going to go in there. You know, and, and we out here in the real world, we put our VR and we can actually see what's going on. He didn't have to do that. He actually went born of a woman and entered into this system, this matrix, and is able to see things we weren't. And then he gives us the power later on, the spirit, so that we can have that same uh, view of, of, of what he's seeing. Maybe not necessarily looking at demons. And, and one thing I want to uh, talk about before I close this thing out is... Um, you know, just because someone is sick or mentally ill, that does not necessarily mean they have an unclean spirit or demon. That that's not always the case. So I, I don't want to to make a mistake and be like, well, you know, this guy 
you know, he, he's, he's got a mental illness. He's probably got a demon or, you know, he's probably got an unclean spirit. That's, that's not the case. You know, there, there are situations where, you know, you have a chemical imbalance, things like that happen. But Jesus is coming on the scene and he's manipulating these things. So if you have a, a, a fever or high infe uh, infection, you're getting fever, he's able to manipulate the body where your white blood cells are, you know, you're, you're healing now. Uh, skin is made whole and new. Limbs are growing back. So this is what he's doing. We're not able to do that. Um, we, we hear about some of the healings in, in the New Testament in Acts. And, and you know, I, I, I don't want to get too much in the healing stuff, but I think that if that was a, a true gift and it was going on today, that people would be hanging out in hospitals, places like that, healing people, not on TV, uh, waving their hand around and letting the crowd fall out in the spirit or, or uh, you know, manipulating the crowd by, by putting your hands on them and saying gibberish and, and, and saying they're healed. That's false. Nowhere does Jesus ever do that. Never do you see Jesus exercise a demon out. One word. That's it. It's gone. So when you see these things in, in other charismatic churches, uh, I'm not saying all the churches, some, th that's false. That's, that's, that's demonology. That, that is not them following Christ. Christ didn't do any of this. So why do they do these things? That's because they're under a false doctrine. They aren't following the true Christ. They're in it for their money, for their, their fame. And so genuine healing comes from Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we had the ability to heal, like I said, I'm sure we would be sitting at the hospitals. We'd be sitting... Uh, in places where people needed us, children's hospital, just walk through and heal everybody. You know, we don't have to get on TV and, and hey, send this much money and I guarantee you'll be healed. That is foolishness. Jesus came on the scene with the authority, with power, astonishing everybody. And now the kingdom is, is being manifested. Now people are coming to Christ. Hope is, is now here. The Messiah is, is on the scene. And now this thing is growing. We finally made it through chapter one. <laughs> so we're going to take bigger chunks uh, uh, and try to get through this whole lesson. So a reflection uh, of today's message is we talked about the unclean living and the vermin and the, the demons. So and you could just answer this inwardly as we usually do. Just ask yourself, are you living righteously? Are we trying to apply the word of God to our lives in every area so that we can manifest the kingdom? The second one, are you serving with gratitude? Just like Peter's mother-in-law. You know, it's not because she was a woman. Hey, you, you should be in the kitchen. That, that is false. She served because of her gratitude. So when you have an experience with Christ and he heals you or, or he brings you out of a situation that only he can, your response should be, Serving with gratitude. And then are you making time to pray? Jesus got up really early in the morning, away from his disciples, and he made time to fellowship with the Father. We even read that whenever he was being baptized. He came up out of the water praying to the Father. So he stayed in constant uh, fellowship with the Father through his whole life. Even when he was on the cross, he was praying. So we, we, we got to ask ourselves, are we doing that? Even in our tough situations, even in the times of temptation, that's when you should be praying the most. Not, not just like, oh man, I, I don't want to do this and I'm struggling. Man, take that thing to God and, and, and see what happens. It, you, you have to stay in connection. And, and then, then the Spirit comes through. And then you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. You don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. So stay in that, that fellowship. And now we're going to look at application. Romans, if we're not going to read of all, all of Romans 12, but when you get an opportune time, Romans 12, 1 through 21, I thought was a perfect application for this. I only broke it up into three sections. So if you want to read it a little later, this is what it is. So the application is be a living sacrifice. And that's going to be in verses 1 and 2. Um, you want to be able to submit yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit, to God, and, and, and give up your, your, your body as a living instrument, a living sacrifice for the Lord. Second one, serve God with your spiritual gifts. And you're going to read that between verses 3 and 8. Whatever God had blessed you with um, to help expand the kingdom, whether it be just, hey, you know, you're a good talker, you're a good listener, and you can do that with your brothers and sisters so you can encourage them or carry their burdens or, or let them piggyback off your faith, that's what we're to do. 
Uh, and then lastly, verses 9 through 21 in Romans 12, is live like a Christian. Um, that means you're, you're putting God first in all things, every area of your life, that you're, you're, the, the decisions you make are rooted in Christ, not just what you feel. Well, I feel like I want to do this or I feel like I want to do that or it just seems like I, I you know, don't don't do that. Go to the word, the solid word of God and apply that to your lives and then begin to live out this thing. Walk in the spirit was uh, one of the um, applications we talked about uh, a couple Sundays ago. And that's going to go right along with this. We have to live this thing out in a way that is pleasing and acceptable to the father. That is all I have for you today. I know we went through that really quick. Preferably the next two uh, chapters we can get through uh, quicker. And if you're here today or online and you're, you're, you're hearing this series and you're, you're kind of figuring out who Christ is. And now that we've gotten into the demonology and hearing, healing and you hadn't made that choice to make Christ your savior. This is the, the, the time to uh, make that choice. Today is the day of salvation, is what the Word says. You don't want to wait any longer. You don't want to be like, well, I want to test out this, or I heard about this religion. Man, if, if you are feeling convicted and, and the Holy Spirit's tugging at your heart now, I, I definitely pray that you make that choice to take that red pill, just like in the, in the movie The Matrix. See, Christ shed His red blood for you so that you can live in the truth, so that you can know who He is, so that you can be reconciled to the Father. And now we will open up the floor to questions, comments,